We often look to nootropics and supplements or life hacks or the latest shiny new thing to help improve our performance in medical school. The reality is that while it's not sexy, your actual performance comes down to three factors. And those three factors dictate 95% of your overall performance. And if those things aren't dialed in, then it doesn't matter which new drug you're taking or what new life hack you're trying out, you simply won't be achieving your full potential. By using these strategies in this video, I was able to get through medical school without relying on caffeine or stimulants, which I know some people think is impossible, but I promise you, you can do it too. Med students and residents spend literally thousands of hours learning about the human body and optimizing health and teaching others, their patients, on how to be healthy. But because of the long hours in the clinic and the studying and the high levels of stress, it makes it really difficult to actually practice what you preach. So I'm not going to bore you with the long-term health benefits of good sleep and nutrition and exercise, but I'm going to tell you how it optimizes your performance as a future clinician. First, your cognitive performance is much improved when you're healthy. Second, staying healthy is obviously good for your mental health and that improves your resilience to things like stress and burnout. And third, this one we don't actually talk about enough. It makes you more confident and effective when counseling patients about lifestyle factors. Physicians who have a normal BMI compared to those who are either overweight or obese are more likely to counsel their patients on things like weight management or nutrition or exercise. And this is important because patients are more likely to lose weight when their physicians directly discuss this with them. And perhaps even more interestingly is that according to a 2013 survey, respondents reported more mistrust of physicians who are either overweight or obese. They were less inclined to follow their medical advice and were more likely to change providers if the physician was perceived to be overweight or obese compared to normal weight physicians who elicited significantly more favorable reactions. But if you clicked on this video, you already know how important it is to be healthy in med school and residency, but much easier said than done. So how do you actually do it? It comes down to one thing. You gotta make your health a priority, and I'm gonna show you how to do so with the least amount of effort with the most bang for your buck. You and I know that time is a finite resource. There are only so many hours in a day. If you're a med student or resident, I'm preaching to the choir, right? But oftentimes we're so focused on clinic and studying and research and all these various things that self-care kind of takes a back seat. But if you wanna be healthy and therefore optimize your performance, then it needs to be a priority, which brings me to my first point, having a routine. What you'll find in both med school and residency is that there's just so many things to do and you feel like you'll never have enough time. But what you will find out is that when you intelligently and intentionally optimize your time, there's actually more time than you think. And this is why building a routine is so important. It's actually one of the most impactful things you can do for both starting and maintaining healthy habits. And part of the reason that routines are so powerful is that they remove the thinking part of the equation. So now when things are automatic, you no longer have to think if or when you need to do a certain behavior. And the way you do this is by time boxing. So start by opening up your favorite calendar app of choice and put in the inflexible items first. So things like class or research or clinic, things you can't actually move. Then schedule in the relatively fixed items, things like meals. And then lastly, schedule in those more flexible items which are focused on those three pillars, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. If you don't find a way to make time in your schedule for those three things, you're just not gonna do it. And once you make a routine, once you know what you need to do, one of the hardest parts is actually sticking to it. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Levels. You may be thinking right now, what does having a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, have anything to do with optimizing your performance in med school? The reason is that good blood sugar control isn't just for avoiding diabetes and obesity, metabolic disease, but also for improving your energy levels and your mental function, both of which are super important in med school and residency. The old thinking was that these continuous glucose monitors were only for diabetic patients who needed to actively monitor their blood sugars. What we're learning is that so-called healthy people also have a lot to gain by using this technology, and Levels is bringing that technology to the masses. The way it works is pretty simple. You have a sensor on your arm, I'm actually wearing one under my shirt right here, and throughout the day, it's gonna tell you what's happening with your blood sugar. And this information is very powerful for you to optimize your mental performance or your metabolic fitness. And just like blood sugar influences many other things like your energy levels or your cognitive function, many other things also influence your blood sugar. So those three pillars, nutrition, sleep, and exercise, all influence and culminate and are reflected in your actual blood sugar readings. So when any one of those three things are off in my life, I actually see it reflected in my blood sugar. It's a much more objective metric rather than just going based off my subjective feeling of the day. So for example, if I'm sleep deprived, then I'll see my glucose variability all over the place, meaning I go up and down much more. And then also the glucose excursion, so the spike, the amplitude of the spike after I eat will be much higher. And not surprisingly, both my energy and my cognitive function are kind of crappy when that happens. But the most powerful Powerful thing is that by having this information every single day, I consistently make better decisions. I was actually telling my dentist friend recently that of all the trackers and wearables and health optimization tools, 
that this is the most powerful one. I've noticed strong and immediate improvements that are sustained, that are consistent because of the accountability. So for example, if I'm gonna eat something that is less than optimal from a health perspective, which was most recently Korean barbecue. Spicy meat. <laughs> yeah, boy. That I know that I need to either exercise before or after to minimize any damage. And I also know from personal experience that for me, cardio is much more effective than strength training. My favorite thing is that by discouraging me from eating sweets, it actually kept me off sweets for long enough to break my sugar addiction. So I had a Saturday night cheat meal slash dessert time for myself every week, but now I just, most Saturdays I skip. I just don't even feel the need to have dessert anymore. That's some powerful shit. Levels is currently in semi-closed beta, and at the time of this recording, there are over 100,000 people on the wait list. But they worked with me to make sure you guys can get one and skip the line by using the link down in the description. Okay, so we know that health is important, we gotta make time for it, make it a priority, but how do we actually do it? Here are some actionable tips for each of the three pillars. Let's start with nutrition, which I have done tons of experimentation on. Here's what I've learned. First, one of the best ways to actually eat healthy is by making eating healthy very convenient. If you have a lot of friction involved with that process, then you're just gonna default when you're tired or busy or whatever to some quicker, more convenient, but much junkier food. And one way to do this is by meal prepping. So pick a day of the week and then set aside a couple hours to make four to seven days worth of meals. The key thing here is reducing friction and making it more convenient. So at the end of a long day in clinic or in the OR, you don't wanna go home and have to spend another 30 minutes or an hour cooking food, right? You're just gonna swing by in and out on the way back. But if you already have something that is healthy and prepared, that's the easier, more convenient option. You can actually take that with you to school or to the clinic. I had my own lunchbox back in med school. I called that my, my chick magnet. Or even when you get home, it's just quick to microwave it and boom, you're done. You don't need to wait in line at the drive-thru. The two downsides of meal prepping is, first, it can take a lot of time, and then two, you can grow tired if you're doing the same meal day in and day out. One of the best ways around the time commitment aspect was actually getting a slow cooker because you just throw in a lot of ingredients, press a button, and then a few hours later, you're ready to go. The other option is to throw money at the problem. So instead of meal prepping yourself, you go hire a service that's gonna meal prep for you. You know, it's interesting how med students and residents are oftentimes very hesitant to spend money on things like meal prep because it feels expensive, right? It's like $15 for a meal that's not even that filling. And yet they usually don't even give second thought to buying the latest gadget or go out drinking on the weekends. If you're trying to make health a priority, then it should be reflected in all aspects of your life, including your finances. So if I look at your credit card statement, I should see health as a priority. I shouldn't be seeing all these transactions off the dollar menu at McDonald's. The other thing is to choose healthy options because yeah, there's gonna be times when we wanna eat out. Here's the crazy paradoxical thing. I actually felt like I had more freedom when I had rules about what I would order when I was going out to eat. So back in med school, I was actually on a plant-based diet. So obviously very restricted there, but even beyond that, let's say you're not plant-based and I'm not plant-based anymore. I still had other rules like no deep fried or I wouldn't drink any calories unless it was like a a smoothie as a meal replacement. So when I went out and the menu had those options, I just immediately ignored it because I knew I couldn't have it. So then when I loosened my diet in 2019, I was like, oh, I'm free. I'm gonna eat more things and have a more varied diet. I actually found eating out to be more challenging because now I had to think to myself, oh, hmm. I had this junky food yesterday. Can I have it today? Should I wait till tomorrow? So when I loosened my diet in 2019, after being influenced by one of my foodie friends, I actually found myself on a slippery slope and I was eating worse and worse foods. That's actually how I got my sugar addiction, which levels ultimately helped me break. But I found it taking much more mental energy whenever I went out to eat. I'd be thinking like, oh, can I have this thing? Should I have it? How am I feeling right now? And it sounds so insignificant, but even that minor level of cognitive load has an impact on you. So the funny thing is I wanted to practice more openness and freedom in all aspects of my life after going off the deep end in residency when I was trying to build the two businesses and do surgical residency at the same time. But I actually found that, you know, last year when I started tightening my diet again, I have a better relationship to food and I enjoy my food more. One of the things that Levels has taught me too is the, uh, the quality of ingredients matters, right? So I was in LA at this hotel that had some healthy cold pressed organic juice and I was like, hmm, I wonder if that juice won't spike me as hard compared to the whatever Tropicana juice you get at the grocery store. And after drinking it, I went straight to Spike City. So I'm back to no juice ever. Simple. One other thing that I found really helpful, I actually did this during my cut. I've done one cut in my life. This is like a year, a year and a half ago. I would exercise some portion control and I would stop eating before I was full. And I reminded myself that once I stopped eating and once some digestion took place, I would actually feel more, more satiated. Worked every time. And then the last thing is 
exploiting those quick, healthy meal replacements. So I would do these really massive smoothies that were like 900 plus calories every morning back in med school and residency. And I would have my protein, my complex carbs, and my healthy fats all in one. And it took maybe two minutes to make. All right, next is exercise. You get the most benefit from exercise, regardless of what type of exercise it is, when you're consistent with it, when it's part of your routine. And you'll actually reach a critical threshold, this point where if you miss a day or two of exercising, you actually feel off, you feel kind of bad, and you want to exercise to feel better again. And if that sounds crazy to you and you hate exercise, trust me, everyone can get there. The key is number one, pushing through that initial resistance that lasts for the first month or two when you, when you really don't like it until you get to the point where the endorphins have a positive feedback loop and you start to crave exercise. And then number two, find the exercise that you enjoy or at least the exercise that you hate the least. And then of course, there's the counter argument that, hey, there's not enough time. You don't need to have some like epic two to three hour workout once a week, right? It's better to have multiple shorter bursts of exercise throughout the week instead. Another way to incorporate exercise is by killing two birds with one stone, doing something else you need to do anyways, like commuting. So you can either walk or bike to the hospital or to school. So back when I was in med school and in residency, I would bike literally everywhere, to school, to campus, to the library, to the gym. And with the knowledge I have now, and and after you know, these years of self-experimentation, I think this was a massive component of how I was able to intensely study and work for so many years without burning out. I actually explain more about that right here. So by doing this, I was able to regularly exercise without even having to think about it. It was just a matter of getting from point A to point B, and it didn't add any time to my day. In fact, it was oftentimes quicker than driving and then spending five minutes trying to find parking. The downside is that it does require you to live closer to campus, and that does mean paying a premium on rent in most instances. But again, going back to spending money on your health. All right, last is sleep. This is one of the most challenging ones to really dial in during med school and residency, partially because if they want you in the hospital at 4 a.m. and you don't get out until 10 p.m., there's no way you're gonna get enough sleep. I remember on one plastic sub eye, we were on triple call that week. So it was plastics, face, and hand trauma call. And I was working 18 to 19 hours a day for like three or four days that week. It was insane because then you have to go home and then study for the next day's cases because on a sub I, on a sub internship in your fourth year, if you go into the OR and you don't know the patient, you don't know the case, you don't know the details, that's a big no-no. But even here, you don't have to just accept defeat. You should obviously be getting your seven to nine hours whenever you can, but in those instances where you simply cannot, the quality of your sleep is also extremely important, not just the quantity. Okay, so how do you do that? One thing is having a really good pre-bedtime routine dialed in. This does two really important things. The first is that it primes your parasympathetic nervous system for sleep, and the parasympathetic is your rest and digest. That's a good thing, that's what you want. And then the second thing is that it acts as classical conditioning, and that tells your subconscious that, okay, time to rest, time to relax, time to get ready for bed. So my pre-bedtime routine has changed a little bit over the years, but some key things, number one, I reduce blue light exposure. I should make the lights throughout my house red. I take a warm shower, and then I practice either mindfulness or HRV training. More recently, it's HRV training combined with stretching at night for about 10 to 20 minutes. The other thing that's really helpful for those of you who have sleep onset insomnia because your mind is just racing, is having a notebook and a pen right on your nightstand. So then if you have this idea, this really good idea that you don't wanna forget, you just write it down on your notepad and that traps the idea on paper so that you can let go of it, not worry about forgetting it, and then more easily relax into sleep. And of course, I minimize my screen usage before bed. So you can do that either by not using your phone, easier said than done. You can also, number two is using blue light blocking glasses. Or number three, I have a shortcut set up on my phone that reduces the white point. So it dims the screen even more than the lowest brightness setting. Now, when you have your diet, your exercise, your nutrition dialed in, you'll find that you don't really even need stimulants such as caffeine to get through the day. I can literally count on my hands how many times I needed coffee or caffeine, either in med school or in residency. And no, I wasn't using any other stimulants either. That being said, if you do enjoy your coffee, you do enjoy your occasional energy drink, then avoid having it too late in the day. Now, the average half-life for caffeine in most individuals is five hours, but it really varies. Some people as little as two hours, some people as great as 12 hours. So if you have issues falling asleep or issues with your sleep quality, then be really mindful of this. It's best practice to avoid any caffeine consumption eight hours before bedtime. And for me, that means I avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. No matter how busy you get during med school and residency, it's important not to neglect your own health. A doctor that doesn't take care of their own health it's gonna have a hard time taking care of others. Make those three pillars of sleep, 
nutrition, and exercise a core priority in your life. And don't be afraid to invest money in your health either. Spend a little extra on rent so you can live closer to the hospital or school, so you can either walk or bike, or just so you can get more sleep at night. Invest in meal prep services if that improves your diet, and use tools like Levels to help hold you accountable. As the old saying goes, the best investment you can make is in yourself. Much love, my friends. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in that next one.